everyone and welcome to this interactive session on residence parking and the potential solutions available to the council to address the issue that many of you will experience. My name is John Berry and I'm the Sustainable Transport and Parking Team Leader at Dundee City Council. I'm also joined tonight by my colleague Mandy Sivright, who is the council's Principal Parking Officer. Over the next 20 minutes or so, I'll do my best to explain some of the history behind this issue, to give some useful background to the process and to discuss some of the wider societal changes that we might expect to see in the next 10 years, and then focus in on some of the solutions that might be available to the council to improve the lives of local residents and specifically address concerns about parking. At the end of this session, I hope you know more about parking policy than you did at the start and will have a more informed opinion about what you want to see happen next. This is important because the council is only likely to make change if it's confident that most residents understand both the potential advantages and disadvantages of a resident parking scheme and still want the council to act. At the end of our session, Mandy and I will do our best to answer any questions that you have submitted using the question and answer function. The Q&As will be anonymous. You won't be able to see the questions asked by others and we won't be mentioning anyone by name. But please do submit your questions and don't feel you have to wait until the end before doing so. Last night we did this session and a lot of the questions came in at the end. It would help us, I think, if you were able to submit questions over the next 10, 15 minutes if you already know what you want to ask. OK, to begin. Parking can be an emotive issue that has the potential to cause great anxiety and distress to some car owners. These issues are often most pronounced when individual car owners don't have somewhere of their own to keep their car. It's recognised that a huge number of homeowners in Dundee don't have access to off-street parking, i.e. many people own a car but don't have a driveway or garage in which it can be stored. This leads to significant pressure on residential streets in areas like Stobswell, the Lower Hill Town and the Perth Road for streets to serve two functions. Their original public function as a thoroughfare for helping people get from A to B and then over the last 40 to 50 years, the additional function of providing a place in which homeowners can park their cars. In some areas, parking can be at a real premium as the limited number of parking spaces are chased after by an ever growing number of car owners. The lack of available space for parking can then be exacerbated further by the daily influx of non-residents who are seeking out a free place to park during the day. These commuters who arrive by car and who may walk into central Dundee or to the university campus will park up in residential streets from as early as seven o'clock in the morning and not return to the cars until late afternoon or early evening. This twin pressure from rising levels of car ownership and commuter parking has had many people seeking a solution from the council. So the question is, what can be done? The council has been asked on many occasions to consider a resident parking scheme, and that is the key issue that we are concerned with tonight. That is, is a resident parking scheme the best solution for the challenges that we face. We have been down this road once before. I'm aware that some of you may have been involved in the previous consultation on the detailed proposals for a residence parking scheme in the Perth Road area. Back in 2012, council officers undertook an extensive engagement with residents in the West End. At that time, the plans were well advanced and had been informed by a consultant study that the council had commissioned a couple of years earlier. The proposal was put forward then is not dissimilar to the potential solutions that we are considering today. When we put it to the public vote in 2012, the plans were overwhelmingly rejected, with 72% of the responses being opposed to the plan. The issue of cost and specifically a proposed annual permit fee of £80 was cited by many respondents as the reason for rejection. The response from people living outside the proposed zone was even more emphatic, nearly four to one against the proposed resident scheme. Now, nearly 10 years later, we are tasked with looking at the issue again. 
I want to be clear tonight that the level of detail I will present is not as comprehensive as the detail that was consulted upon back in 2012. Now in 2021, I'm simply tasked with trying to gauge the appetite for a residence parking scheme. Specifically, we've been asked to engage with community groups, but I'm of course, I'm willing to receive written representations from anyone, either via a community group or directly to the council. We've created an email address specifically for your feedback. It is residentparkingscheme at dundiecity.gov.uk. The consultation will close on the 10th of December. I am also investigating other ways for people to participate if they do not have access to email and uh, computers. And this will allow other people to give me feedback on the proposals that we're looking at. Using the information that we received from this engagement, I will then be preparing a committee report that I expect to come before the Council City Development Committee in January 2022. Elected members will then be required to agree what happens next. It could be that they seek a further referendum or vote similar to the process back in 2012. We all know now that binary yes, no or in out votes can be problematic and not everyone will get exactly what they thought they were voting for. Should that potential stage be bypassed, there will still be opportunities for members of the public to have their say, because within, with every formal change of this nature, the legal process requires another stage of public consultation. Before a TRO, that's a traffic regulation order, can be made and take effect, all objections and all letters of support received would be shared with elected members. Whatever happens, it will be a lengthy road before we get a scheme implemented. Now, Chris, if you could put the next slide on, I want to give you a little bit more detail about what a scheme would look like. In effect, the streets in residential areas would be marked with signage and lining as resident parking only. And therefore, they would become only available to residents who had purchased a permit. Can you give me the next slide, please, Chris? It could be that the permit was displayed in a windscreen, but more likely the cars belonging to residents would be listed as permitted on the council's enforcement system. Any car parking in these zones designated for residents without a valid permit would be issued with a penalty charge notice. That's currently a £60 fine and they would be issued by our team of parking attendants. In this way, a scheme would effectively, effectively eliminate commuter parking. If you can give me the next slide, please, Chris. The area covered is shown in the attached series of maps. This is the area that is being considered for a residence parking scheme. It is not the final proposal, and we are very happy to receive feedback on the proposed boundaries. In the West End, the scheme will include all of the Perth Road Lanes area as far as Windsor Street and the Sindarins, and much of the area to the east of Blackness Avenue. Give me the next slide, please, Chris. In the Coldside area, the streets to the north of Durrock Park and south of the Constitution Road and Alexander Street would be included. Give me the next slide, please, Chris. And in Maryfield Ward, much of Lower Stobswell as far as Baxter Park and Watson Street would be included. Now, wherever there is a line on a map, there will be some who feel their address falls on the wrong side of that line. The boundaries selected have been chosen to minimise displacement of commuter cars from one street to the next. More streets could potentially be included in a scheme if the boundary was moved outwards. But that might mean residents who don't consider they have a problem being asked to purchase a permit. If the scheme boundary was reduced, it is possible that the problem parking would move as commuters simply relocated to streets without restrictions. Another thing to consider is that those people living right at the edge of a zone may think they can avoid paying for an annual permit by parking across the street 
into roads that are just outside the zone. The zones on this map were prepared a number of years ago and presented to committee in 2018. Now, as I explained before, we do seek your views on whether these boundaries are in the correct place. OK, look, I'm going to take a short break here, but my colleague Chris will move through the slides which are showing which are showing images that are taken from Google Street View. These show various streets in the zone at different times of the day. Generally, the images are taken during the day when commuting par commuter parking is going on. You'll be able to see that the streets are busy and there is little off street parking. So, Chris, if you could just go through the slides, that would be helpful. So this is Crescent Street, which is in Lower Stobswell area. And you can see there are cars stacked up on either side of the street. And I suggest that a number of the people here will have parked up and walked into the city centre. This is Belfield Avenue and in the far distance there you can see Magdalen Green. This again is an area with lots of tenements, lots of cars either side. It's not clear who these cars belong to. They could be resident cars, they could be commuter cars, but it just shows the pressure on the on street parking situation because there are no garages and no driveways. This is Forest Park Road, which is up in the north of the sort of West End area, and it's just on the edge of where our proposed boundary zone. This road would be inside the residence parking zone if we stick with the blue lines that were shown on the map before. Again, it shows tenements either side and the number of cars parking on the street. And this is a street on the side of the Law Hill, north of uh, Durrett Park. It's Pamir Terrace, and you can see that right along the length of the street are cars parked up. Again, they could belong to the householders, but it is also possible that these are commuters who have parked up for the day and walked down the hill into, into Dundee city centre. Finally, this is a street just to the east of Blackness Avenue called Lytton Street. Again, it's an area where I suspect there's quite a high uh, proportion of student dwelling. And you can see that there's some space in this image, but also uh, you know, quite a lot of requirement to park on street. OK. OK, I want to talk about costs now. I mentioned previously that the previous proposal was rejected on the grounds of cost. Most residents did not consider that an annual permit fee of £80 was fair. Dundee currently has three resident parking schemes in place. There's a scheme in Minas Hill that was introduced to help residents who were experiencing problems caused by Ninewell staff and visitors. Permits for that scheme currently cost £20 per year. There are also schemes in the city centre and Broughty Ferry, and these cost £120 and £84 per annum, respectively. Looking further afield, there are resident parking schemes in many Scottish towns and cities. In Aberdeen, a residential permit costs £60 per annum. In Glasgow, it's £85 per year. And in Edinburgh, it's £101 per year. Pricing structures can be more complex, but these are the headline prices for schemes elsewhere and might act as a guide for any new scheme in Dundee. The permit fee would be used to to fund the implementation of a new scheme and meet the recurring costs of maintaining it and managing it. I think it's unrealistic to think that a scheme might be introduced if an annual permit fee was as low as £25, but ultimately this is a matter for councillors. At this time, there is no funding that has been set aside for the implementation of a new residence parking scheme. If it were to happen, it's likely that the councillors would introduce it with a permit fee that was capable of generating sufficient income each year to meet to meet the setup costs and the ongoing running costs. You might ask next, what would a permit entitle me to? This is a key issue for everyone to consider. As a resident, a permit scheme will help you because it will give you priority over commuters. 
shoppers and other non-residents. It will not, however, guarantee you a space and you will potentially be competing with your neighbours for the spaces in your street. A scheme will also make it harder for people who may want to visit you who are arriving by car. There are a number of ways to address visitor parking. It could be that the hours of the scheme are limited only to commuting times. For example, Monday to Friday from nine o'clock to four o'clock. Alternatively, we could create designated areas in the street that were marked out for visitors and are restricted to perhaps a couple of hours. Another solution would be for the council to issue books of visitor permits available only for sale to residents. These would have a monetary value, e.g. two pounds each, and they would be dated so that you could give them to your guests and visitors. In effect, these vouchers would give the guest car the same parking rights as the residents has, but on a temporary basis. Another issue to consider is whether there should be a cap on the number of permits issued to a single household. Given the competition for spaces, it could be that a maximum of one permit is issued per household. Or it could be that the second permit is issued, but with a premium price. That's what happens in Edinburgh, where a second permit for the same address costs 50% more than the first permit. I welcome your views on these issues. And in the West End, particularly where there are a number of houses of multiple occupation, it's certainly something that we need to consider. Finally, before I conclude, I want to draw your thoughts to other factors at play that might influence your thinking on this matter. We're still, we're still trying to understand the impact of COVID, but one thing that most commentators agree is that there will be an increase in home working and a decrease in commuting on a daily basis. We should therefore consider how that might affect the parking in our area. We need to consider whether there'll be change in travel behaviour in the years to come. Government policy is to reduce the number of car kilometres by 20% in the next 10 years. That means less car journeys and perhaps lower car ownership in the future. It's possible that government policy will make it harder and more expensive to be a car owner in the future, not easier. The Council is seeking to support commuters to travel more sustainably. We want to see more people on buses, we want to see more people walking and cycling into work and more people joining car clubs. There will be policies to support these ambitions and these may in turn reduce the number of commuters who travel to the city centre by car. Park and ride sites are also being considered again, with consultants to be appointed to look at the best locations where these could succeed. Should they be delivered? they could in turn reduce the number of commuters driving into central Dundee. And finally, we are looking at our parking tariffs and investigating ways that the council can increase usage of our multi-storey car parks in central Dundee. We know we've got plenty of capacity in our car parks and I'm sure it's a source of frustration to many people in this uh, session tonight that their streets are clogged up with cars when council car parks might lie half empty. We accept the need to review our pricing so that car parks are more attractive to commuters and we can have the best overall outcome for the city. OK, that's the end of what I want to say. I'm now happy to answer any questions that you may have asked during this presentation. We have until eight o'clock to do this. If there's a question that I've not addressed at the end, you may be able to find that on our frequently asked questions section on our consultation page which is dundeecity.gov.uk forward slash RPS, Resident Parking Scheme. And if you want to comment, please, after this session, please do email residentparkingscheme at dundeecity.gov.uk before the 10th of December. OK, I am going to take a wee break there. I'm going to ask my colleague Mandy to hopefully look through some of the questions that have been coming in while I've been speaking. And um, we'll do our very best to answer them over the next few while. So Mandy, hopefully you can hear me. Are there any questions that you would like to pick out from what's come in? 
Yeah, John, uh, the first question that's came through is that you've mentioned reviewing multi-storey parking prices. Will this include West End car parks? No, the multi-storey car parks, we have four multi-storey car parks in Dundee City Council that the council runs and they are added to by a couple of other multi-storey car parks that are run by NCP and the Wellgate Centre. So there's plenty of parking capacity in Dundee to accommodate more cars. When I talked about reviewing the cost of parking, I was trying to uh, push us towards and explain that we understand that with the changing ways that people attend work and particularly hybrid working, we need to have a, a model, a product that's attractive to people who maybe only come into work two or three days a week. So we're looking at offering tickets and parking products that are more suitable, will still feel attractive and good value and offer good value, but will try and take away the idea that you need to come to work five days a week to get that good value from the parking tickets. The cost of parking in the West End car parks, and I mean car parks like Rose Angle and Pennycook Lane, that is not to be renewed, at least not anytime soon. At the moment, the first two hours are free, then a half day for a pound, and then a full day for two pounds. And that was agreed just uh, just just before the pandemic came in, uh, before the pandemic hit us, sorry. And, uh, you know, I do not think there's any intention to review the car park tariffs in the West End. John, okay. uh, next question is what alternatives to a residence parking scheme have been considered? OK, well, hopefully I touched on that. We, there are two, in terms of parking, there's either we do nothing and the status quo, quo continues. And that's kind of what happened in 2012. We put forward quite a, a well-developed plan to bring in a residence parking scheme, but it didn't uh, receive the support of the local community and we stepped back from it and effectively there was no restriction and the ex problems that people were being, ex were, were being experienced by people continued. What I want to say is the kind of stuff I was touching on in the last few minutes of my presentation. I really want to see a change in the way people commute to work. I want to see more people traveling sustainably. We've just come off the back of COP26. You know, we know as a society that we need to change the way we travel. We need to see less dependency on cars and commuting by car. So what we need to do as a council is make the alternatives more palatable, more affordable, more convenient and we're working hard with the bus companies we're working hard to improve cycle lanes we're trying to improve uh, routes into the city center that make people think about different ways of traveling into the city center we talked about park and ride sites that might capture people on the outskirts of dundee rather than having traveling driving all the way in so we are looking at many ways that people can think about different ways of traveling into the city center other than just bringing their car in and then perhaps leaving that car in a residential street. OK, Mandy. John, one that we touched on last night, what measures will the council put in place to mitigate the displacement of park and striders into private areas? OK, yeah, I think this is a really important issue for everyone to get their head around and understand. At the moment, there are probably some streets that are affected by park and stride as people driving in, leaving the car in residential street and then walking into town worse than others. But if we were simply to address those streets and say they are now part of the zone, I, I absolutely think that we would just be moving the problem onto the next street. And people who currently perhaps think they don't have a problem would suddenly say, hang on a minute, you've addressed the problems in that street, but all those parkers have just come onto my street now. And that is why the map zone has been presented as it is. We've pushed it far enough out, we think, to try and mitigate and reduce the amount of people who would do that because we've got quite extended areas and we're trying to create a situation where we are not simply moving it from one street to the next. But I want to hear back from people about those blue lines on those maps because if they're in the wrong place and you think we've got them in the wrong place, we are willing to change them and amend them. And uh, the, the maps that are presented tonight and that are on our web page are a starting point for this discussion 
And if you think, for example, your street should have been included or perhaps conversely should not have been included, then you know we would like to hear back from you. So we want to minimize uh, displacement by having the boundary set at a point where people will hopefully say, you know what, this isn't even almost worth driving this far because I've still got a mile or so to walk into town and that's too far for me to do it. I'll just drive the whole way in and park up in one of the multi-storey car parks or similar. John, the next question is what method of evaluation will be used to decide if the residence parking scheme is effective or not? Well, uh, that's a good question. Let me have a think about that. That presupposes that we will have a residence parking scheme. That presupposes that, you know, it will be introduced. And I've got to tell you guys that that is not an absolute foregone conclusion. We are looking at it, but what happened in 2012 is we looked at it really hard and yet still people didn't want the proposal that the council had brought forward. They saw too many flaws in it and they thought it was too expensive and they said, no, we want a solution, but not that solution. So we are going to have to present a solution that, that people are able to make an opinion on. If it goes forward, I think, you know, it would be then extremely unlikely that it would be taken away. I'm not saying impossible, but I think it would be un un really unlikely that it would be taken away. And I don't think uh, evaluation in that sense would be taking place. We might get a large mailbag or councillors might hear from the constituents saying this hasn't worked, but they're already getting a mailbag from, from constituents saying, I've got a problem with parking, can you sort it out? So, you know, we need to understand that the solution that we have on offer, a residence parking scheme, will potentially create new issues that you're not currently experiencing as a resident. For example, what do I do when I have visitors? You know, so there'll be a different set of problems perhaps to 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 face up to if a residence parking scheme is introduced. John, uh, someone has asked if there is access to the consultation from 2012. Um. Well, yes, I think there was a committee report that will be on the council web pages that will detail the outcome of that 2012 uh, outcome. So off the top of my head, and I mentioned it in my presentation, we had 1000 plus responses and 72 percent of the people who took the time to respond said they didn't want the scheme. And we were able to break down between people who lived inside the zone and people who lived outside the zone and to just want to clarify this we weren't talking about people who were the commuters because we weren't asking people in Forfar or Perth or Brody Ferry we were asking people who kind of lived just outside the zone and of the people who lived just outside the zone they were probably fearful of the idea of displacement so on on a, on, a, on four to one they voted against it so when I said there was like an overwhelming rejection, 72% said no thank you to what you what was presented. But when it came to people who are living outside the zone, 80% said no thanks. Now, I think that um, committee report is in the public domain. And what I might do is on our web page, if it's possible, I might try and provide a link to that committee report from way back from 2012. Um, if responses were not in support of a permit scheme, would it be another 10 years before yeah. it would be considered again? Well, you're asking me about uh, looking to my crystal ball. Uh, it could be. It could be that it is kicked into touch and, you know, or kicked into the long grass or whatever expression we say there. This is the really difficult thing, you know. We, we accept at the council that many people have got a genuine problem with this. But the solution as well has to be uh, one that people want and accept and it will come at a cost. Last night, one of the questions put to us was why is it we as the residents have to pay for the permit? Why is it we have to shell out 80 pounds or 50 pounds or 60 pounds a year when it's not us who's causing the problem? The problem has been caused by the commuters who are trying to find free parking spaces. And there is a real issue of fairness there. I accept that. But the solution that is on offer is 
you know, are you as a as a as a community willing to pay that money to get rid of the problem that you're experiencing? And I've heard some people say, "Oh, I'd pay three hundred pounds, two hundred pounds a year for a permit," because for them the issue is so acute that they almost pay anything. And other people say, "You know, it's not a big deal. You know, I'm not prepared to pay more than ten pounds or twenty pounds a year. I want to pay what Minas Hill's paying." And I, I like I say, I don't think the scheme will run if. If, if that's the response to get. So how long will we be before we look at it again? If it doesn't get passed in 2022, I think it could realistically be many more years before it's looked at again. I'd like to think that societal changes will perhaps potentially reduce some of the issues that you guys are experiencing now. I'm reflecting on COVID when I say that, COVID has definitely reduced the amount of commuting in Dundee. Now, you might not see that absolutely, but it's it's certainly the case that far fewer people are coming into the workplace in Dundee than it was than it was pre-COVID, pre, you know, pre-pandemic. So things are changing and the way we travel is changing and the, the way the, the ease of owning a car might become more difficult. And we know that the people are going to have to buy electric cars and we know that pavement parking is going to come along in the next couple of years, which will be a ban of parking on the pavement. So things are changing that in five or 10 years time might potentially address many of the issues that you guys are experiencing now. I can't guarantee that, but it's a possibility that it might begin to resolve itself even if the car, even if the council does nothing. So it's a difficult question. And obviously, ultimately, it's for councillors not council officers to decide how long we go between uh, looking at this issue. John, for those who don't own a car, would they need to buy a visitor pass um, for people who are going to their house um, if they need to rely on getting shopping delivered or there's tradesmen, etc., going to their homes? Yes. Yes. So even though you might not buy an annual permit, you would still be eligible if we, sorry, let me just be clear. If we introduce the system, because this is only one option, but I, you know, I, I, it's an option that has got many uh, merits, I think, the voucher scheme, that you would buy a book of vouchers and uh, you would then be able to give them, a, if you were having a visitor's round, you'd be able to say, look, here's a permit and they would put it on their, on their window and that would be good for the day. Now, yes, you don't have to be a car owner or a, or a permit scheme member to buy the vouchers, but you would need to live in the qualifying area. So somebody who lived in Broughty Ferry or, or Forfar would not be able to buy a book of permits. You would need to have um, proof of residence of living in the council zone. Um, now, I talked about how what the hours of a permit scheme might operate. It could be it's 24-7. Or it could be it only operates on Monday, Fridays and from nine o'clock till five o'clock during the time that most people are commuting. If that was the case, you wouldn't need to use up vouchers in the evening and you wouldn't need to use up vouchers at the weekend if people are coming to visit you. But you might need it to use them on the days, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, if people are coming to visit you during the middle of the day. So, yes, that's how it would work if a voucher scheme for visitors was introduced. John, if a residence parking scheme was to be introduced, can we give assurance that the costs will be capped? No, I'm sorry, I can't give you that uh, assurance. What happens every year is councillors set their budget and we have a process called the review of charges and it includes all the things that the council makes a charge for. And every year, the councils make a decision about whether they want to increase those charges and something like a resident parking permit is the kind of thing that would be looked at. Now, I'm not saying it would increase every year, but my experience of the residence parking scheme fees that we have for the city centre, the Broadly Ferry area and the Minas Hill would tell me that, you know, it is something that has the potential to creep up a little bit each year. So if we were to start off with a permit fee of 60, 70, 80 pounds. In three or four years time, that could be 70, 80, 90 pounds. You know, so yeah, again, a decision for councillors, but I can't give you that guarantee. No, I'm not tonight anyway. John, there's no more direct questions about residence parking 
uh, schemes, but I do have a couple of questions here if you want to answer them about the project for low emission zones coming into effect. I'll do my best. What consideration has been given to the impact of the forthcoming low emission zone? OK, yes, so we've done quite a lot of work on low emission zones. Low emission zone will come into effect. And in as, in as much as that penalty charges will be applied from 2024. So we're still nearly three years away from a low emission zone taking effect because there will be a two year grace period from 2022 for people to get used to the idea of change. The consultants have looked at this because quite a lot of work has done that. Their um, response was that in terms of displacement of parking and potential displacement of cars out of the low emission zone to residential streets, it would it, they estimated that the, the effect would be negligible. They would not be possible to determine any effect. So Yes, we have looked at that and the consultants have concluded as best they can that the impact of a low emission zone would not have any impact, would not have any direct effect on the number of cars parking in residential streets outside the zone. Another sustainable transport question is what consideration has been given to the future needs for electric car charging, which will require parking on street? Well, I mean, a great question. I mean, we are going to have to move to electric vehicles over the next 10 years because by the year 2030, you will not be able to buy an internal combustion engine vehicle new, not a new one anymore. Dundee's already made great strides in terms of electric vehicle charging infrastructure. We've got uh, EV charging hubs in places like Princess Street, Lochie, Rorty Ferry and in all our multi-storey car parks, on the roofs of our multi-storey car parks, not all of them, but on three of them, Olympia, Green Market and Gelly Street, we've got solar panels, taking advantage of the sunshine in Dundee, bringing power to cars. So we're doing a lot to make sure that people can charge up electric cars in the future. I think there will be some expectation that we provide electric vehicle charging infrastructure in local communities on streets. And that will be a difficult one. And it's a difficult one right now because it starts to see, um, you know, the pavements being taken over with charging units. I've seen images of cables being, you know, taken out of kitchen windows and across the footway, across the pavement and into cars. So we need to be careful about the way that people fuel their cars in the future. But I, I think the process that Dundee will follow is to continue establishing these electric charging hubs where you can, whenever you require to, take your car down for a recharge and uh, top up on your uh, on your battery. Now, the range of electric cars is getting better and better all the time. You know, five years ago, electric cars could maybe only go 60 or 70 miles before they required to be topped up again. And now we're probably up 150, 200 miles before they need to be topped up again. And I think, you know, in, in years to come, I think the range of electric vehicles will be the same as what we experience now with petrol cars, that you'll be able to go 300, 350 miles with having to, without having to go back to get filled up again. So I think the likelihood is that electric vehicle charging hubs, the model that we have in Dundee already, will stay. I think it's less likely that we'll have charging on streets in, in public locations. I'm not ruling that out, but I think it's less likely. And we are experimenting with some new technology called pop-up charges, which lower in and out of the ground and sort of disappear when not in use. But, uh, you know, it's very much early technology. Dundee's been at the forefront of this revolution, um, but I don't think we'll see too much electric charging in, in in residential streets. I think it will be done primarily in car parks and EV charging hubs that are created. John, I have got uh, one more question on the residence parking scheme. Okay. Why has this scheme proposal gone under the radar? How are you advertising this consultation? <laughs> right, I mean, why has it gone under the radar? 
I, I mean, I don't think it has gone under the radar. I've been working very hard to uh, promote this. We've been advertising on our council website. We've got a web page. But I accept whenever we do anything like this, people will potentially pick holes at the way we've gone about doing it, the process. All I can tell you is that the councillors were presented with a report uh, 18 months or so ago, just before the pandemic, and they said, go out and consult with community groups. They didn't specify who we should, how we should do that consultation. I've done my best to speak with community groups and community councils and the Stobswell Forum and the Coldside Forum, and I've met with them and tried to listen what is it, and they are very welcome to respond. Um, we're opening up and we're saying, look, anybody can send us in their comments because we do want the comments of people to help inform what happens next. Like I said before, I don't think this is a foregone conclusion. This could go either way, but we need to hear from residents about what they feel about this subject. It's hard because we're in a situation now with COVID where people are not meeting face to face. We can't have community meetings. Um, so we've got to do things like online. I'm going to be doing some, uh, I'm going to be preparing some um, panels, some boards that we will display in um, Arthurston Library and Hilltown Community Centre and perhaps go back to Blackness Library as well. So try and allow people in these libraries and, and people who visit these areas to know that there's a consultation going on. But I'm relying on my colleagues who have got contacts in the communities to spread the word. But not everybody is part of, is joined into that. Not everybody reads the evening telly. Not everybody reads the courier. Not everybody goes on the Dundee City of Council webpage. So we're doing our very best to advertise these events and to let people know that there's the potential to have their say. But I'm not saying we'll reach everybody. And I don't really think that's a, don't know if that's a realistic ask anyway to say that we can reach everybody. We can only do our best to let people know about these events. I think we've done that. Um, and, you know, we want to hear from as many people as possible. So anyone listening tonight, uh, you're very welcome to tell your friends, neighbours all about this. Now, Chris at the start mentioned that this was being recorded. It is going to be put up on YouTube. You will be able to review this and watch it again to your heart's content, should that be something you want to do. And if you want to share it with neighbours and friends, you can let them know that the link is there. So all the things I've said tonight, all the questions I've answered will be able to be viewed by anybody at their own leisure over the next few weeks, even if they haven't been able to come in and listen in tonight. I've got one more question, John. OK. Will using pop up chargers need to pay for a permit too? Blimey. Will people using pop-up charges be required to use a permit to? So I said that the, the pop-up charges are very much at the early stages of deployment. We're, we're, we're trialing innovative new technology in Dundee that we haven't really, hadn't really been tested anywhere else. You know, we are very much at the beginning of the journey to EV and Dundee has, you know, grasped the nettle and really tried to take it on. So we are trying out new technology. If those pop-up charges we're in a residence parking zone. Of course, that presents a new problem that perhaps that we haven't thought about because we've put in a pop up charge in a place that perhaps only residents can get to and not commuters. So I would say, you know, we potentially do have an issue there and we've got to be careful about how we take it forward. But pop up charges are likely only to be available to the residents if a resident zone existed. If a resident parking scheme isn't introduced, then those pop up charges would potentially be available to anyone who cares to turn up at them and is able to get a spot. It's a complicated question and something perhaps that we need to think through carefully as we develop these different policies, resident parking scheme and EV charging policies. And you know, we need to make sure that they don't sort of bump up against each other and cause difficulties. There's no more questions for the moment, John. OK, Mandy. Right, look, thank you very much, everybody, for tuning in tonight. Um, we will gladly receive your comments. The place to email them is resident parking scheme at dundeecity.gov.uk. And if you can send them in over the next two to three weeks, as I said, encourage your neighbours if they think they need to hear about this to tune into the watch the YouTube video 
or or just have a read of our frequently asked questions on our web page. But we are very keen to hear from you. Once this consultation stage is ended, I will be preparing that committee report and taking it to committee in January, in late January 2022. And that will then be for the councillors to decide what happens next with this process. It could go in one or two different ways. There could be another sort of vote, another kind of, you know, trying to formally understand on a yes no basis whether people want the scheme that has been proposed. Or alternatively, <coughs> excuse me, or alternatively, the councillors could go direct to a TRO process and then consult legally and formally and listen to the objections and letters of support that come in and make a decision on whether they want to proceed on that basis. So it's really important that residents have their say and make their voices heard. And I hope you can do that. And I hope this session has been beneficial for allowing you to understand what a resident scheme would look like, understand what the benefits would be, but also what some of the drawbacks would be. And so that you have an informed opinion about the way you want this to go. And you can let that be passed on to your councillors either through this consultation or you can go direct to councillors if you wish. So if there are no more questions, Mandy, I will wrap this up and say good night to you all. OK, good night. Good night.